Hey, I'm James, and in this video I'm going to discuss the anatomy associated with the orbits. Firstly, I will describe the bony orbits. I will then describe the associated musculature, innervation, and blood supply. Finally, I will discuss cranial nerve palsies and subsequent paralysis of the extraocular muscles. Check out the fantastic article on the Geeky Medics website to get more information on the anatomy of the eye. Subscribe to Geeky Medics to be the first to know when we release new videos. The orbit is a pyramidal shaped bony cavity that houses the eyeball. At the base of the pyramid is the orbital margin, which is formed by the frontal bone superiorly, the frontal and zygomatic bone laterally, the maxilla and zygomatic bone inferiorly, and finally the maxilla and the frontal bone medially. The medial wall forms a partition between the orbit and the nasal cavity and therefore some nerves and arteries passing within the orbit will enter into the nasal cavity through this medial wall here. I will discuss some of these nerves later on in the video. The bones that form the medial wall include the maxilla, the lacrimal bone, the ethmoid bone, and the body of the sphenoid most posteriorly. The floor of the orbit forms a partition between the orbit and the maxillary sinus. The integrity of the wall is therefore important to prevent the contents of the maxillary sinus passing into the orbit, or vice versa. The bones that form the floor include the maxilla, the zygomatic bone, and the orbital process of the palatine bone. The inclusion of the palatine bone within the orbit is quite difficult to appreciate, so here's the palatine bone in isolation to demonstrate how it projects into the orbit. Here is a portion of the palatine bone that forms the posterior part of the hard palate. And here is the orbital process. The roof of the orbit is formed by the frontal bone and the lesser wing of the sphenoid. It forms a wall between the orbit and the anterior cranial fossa, and in some instances, the frontal sinus. The lateral wall is formed by the zygomatic bone and the greater wing of the sphenoid. There are two deficiencies in the posterior portion of the lateral wall that are named the superior and inferior orbital fissures. The superior orbital fissure allows for communication between the middle cranial fossa and the orbit. The inferior orbital fissure allows for communication between the pterygopalatine fossa and the orbit. These fissures allow for nerves and vessels to reach the orbit. So I will add the eyes and will rotate the model so that I can point out something obvious, but very important. The eyes face anteriorly. The significance of this cannot be appreciated until we remove the calvaria and look at the orbit from a superior view with the roof of the orbit removed. The red arrow demonstrates where the eyeball faces, and the blue arrow demonstrates the long axes of the orbit. Therefore, the muscles have a resting muscle tone to stabilise the position of the eye. The coordinated contraction and simultaneous relaxation of the extraocular muscles result in movement of the eyeball. With the extraocular muscles added to the model, it is possible to see the rough attachments of the muscles of the orbit. I will discuss levator palpi brae superioris first, as this muscle acts on the superior eyelid, not the eyeball. It arises from the apex of the orbit, and the muscle inserts onto the upper eyelid, as we can see when we rotate the model. Before I describe the extraocular muscles, I will first fade levator palpi brae superioris, so we can see superior rectus just inferior to it. I will now describe the extraocular muscles with levator palpi brae superioris removed from the model. The four recti muscles are labelled on the model. The easiest muscles to describe are the medial and the lateral recti. They both arise from the apex of the orbits from a common tendinous ring and attach to the medial and lateral aspects of the eyeball and act to adduct and abduct the eye respectively. The superior and inferior recti are slightly more complicated due to how the muscles pass within the orbit. On the model now, the maxilla and the zygomatic bones have been faded so we can see how the inferior rectus passes within the orbit. The inferior rectus passes obliquely from the apex of the orbit at a common tendinous ring to attach to the inferior surface of the eye. The consequence of this is that this muscle will have multiple actions. This muscle depresses adducts and extorts the eye. The superior rectus also passes obliquely through the orbit, as we can see on the model here. 
to insert onto the superior aspect of the eye. Consequently, contraction of superior rectus elevates, adducts, and entorts the eye. The remaining extraocular muscles include the superior and inferior obliques. The superior oblique arises from the body of the sphenoid and passes anteriorly within the orbit. The muscle then gives way to a tendon that passes through a loop of fibrocartilage that is attached to the frontal bone, known as the trochlea. The tendon then passes posteriorly and laterally to attach to the eyeball. The action of this muscle is to depress, abduct and entort the eye. The inferior oblique arises from the floor of the orbit and passes posterior laterally to attach to the posterior inferior lateral surface of the eyeball. When inferior oblique contracts, it will elevate, abduct, and extort the eye. If I remove the eyeball for a second, we can look at the common tenderness ring at the apex of the orbit. The only muscles that attach here include the recti muscles. The remaining muscles of the orbit have bony attachments. Now with the eye put back into the model, let's summarize the movements of the more challenging extraocular muscles. So superior rectus elevates and adducts, Inferior rectus depresses and adducts. Superior oblique depresses and abducts. Inferior oblique elevates and abducts. Inferior rectus and oblique extort. And superior rectus and oblique intort. It is worth pointing out that directly elevating and depressing the eye without any other movements will involve the coordinated contraction of multiple muscles. This is because those muscles that perform these movements also perform either lateral or medial movements that must be cancelled out. For example, superior rectus and inferior oblique elevate the eye, but have secondary movements to adduct and abduct the eye respectively. However, the coordinated contraction of both of these muscles allows for the medial and lateral movements to cancel each other out. The same also applies for depression of the eye with inferior rectus and superior oblique. Pure abduction and adduction are performed by the lateral and medial recti respectively. Now I will focus on the nerves and return to a superior view of the orbit. So the first nerve I'm going to describe is the optic nerve. The optic nerves arise from the optic chiasma, which we can see is located here, and pass towards the optic canal, which is located within the sphenoid bone. The optic nerve then passes through the common tendinous ring to reach the eye here. The majority of the nerves that continue towards the orbit pass through the superior orbital fissure. The first nerves that I will describe are those that do not pass through the common tendinous ring, those being the lacrimal, frontal and trochlear nerves, as well as the superior division of the ocular motor nerve. The lacrimal and frontal nerves arise from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. The lacrimal nerve passes laterally within the orbit and contains sensory and autonomic fibres for the lacrimal gland. The frontal nerve passes superiorly to the vata palpebrae superioris and continues anteriorly. The branches of the frontal nerve continue to the forehead. The trochlear nerve innervates the superior oblique muscle. And finally, the superior division of the ocular motor nerve innervates the vata palpebrae superioris and superior rectus. The nerves that pass within the common tendinous ring include the nasociliary nerve, the inferior division of the ocular motor nerve, and the abducens nerve. The nasociliary nerve is a branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve that passes medially within the orbit. Long and short ciliary nerves arise from this nerve to enter the eye. The long ciliary nerve contains sensory fibres for the ciliary body, iris and cornea, and postganglionic sympathetic fibres for the dilator pupillae muscles. The short ciliary nerves extend from the ciliary ganglion, which is an autonomic ganglion. These nerves contain sensory fibres, sympathetic fibres for the vasculature, and parasympathetic nerves for the ciliary body and sphincter pupillae. The nasociliary nerves continue on the medial wall of the orbit and give off posterior and anterior ethmoidal nerves that enter into the nasal cavity. Just before the branching of the anterior ethmoidal nerve, the infratrochlear nerve arises and extends towards the bridge of the nose. The inferior division of the ocular motor nerve innervates medial rectus, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique. The abducens nerve innervates lateral rectus. The remaining nerves that enter the orbit are branches of the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. The maxillary nerve leaves the base of the skull through the foramen rotundum, passes within the pterygopalatine fossa, and enters the orbit via the infraorbital fissure, 
The maxillary nerve leaves the base of the skull through the foramen rotundum, passes within the pterygopalatine fossa, and enters the orbit via the infraorbital fissure. If we rotate the model and look at the lateral surface of the skull, with the zygomatic bone removed, we can see how these nerves pass through the pterygopalatine fossa and the infraorbital fissure. Anteriorly, we can see the infraorbital nerve passing through the infraorbital foramen, and the zygomaticotemporal and the zygomaticofacial nerves. I have also included the infratrochlear nerve on the model, which arises from the nasociliary nerve, and the supraorbital, and the supratrochlear nerves, which are branches of the frontal nerve. All nerves labelled on this model carry sensory information from the skin covering the temporal bone, maxilla, nose, and frontal bone. The blood supply to the orbit comes from the ophthalmic artery, which is a branch of the internal carotid artery. The ophthalmic artery enters the orbit via the optic canal. The arterial supply and venous drainage are summarised in the anatomy of the eye article on the Geeky Medics website. I am going to finish this video by returning to an anterior view and summarising the innovation to the extraocular muscles as well as describing ocular nerve paralyses. The text box summarises the innovation of the extraocular muscles. You will note that the only extraocular muscles not innervated by the ocular motor nerve are the superior oblique, which is innervated by the trochlear nerve, and lateral rectus, which is innervated by the abducens nerve. There are two ways to remember this exception. Firstly, if you remember that the superior oblique muscle has a trochlea and the lateral rectus muscle abducts, you should be able to remember the innervation. Alternatively, the mock chemical formula written here will help. SO4, LR6, AO3, or superior oblique 4, lateral rectus 6, all others 3. So I will finish with ocular paralysis. Patients with a third nerve palsy will present with a drooping of the eyelid. When the eyelid is elevated either by yourself or the patient, you will see that the pupil is dilated and the eye is pointing down and out. The reasons for this presentation is that the ocular motor nerve innervates the vata palpebrae superioris, which elevates the eye. Cranial nerve 3 also carries the parasympathetic fibres to sphincter pupillae, and so there will be unopposed dilation of the pupil. Finally, the ocular motor nerve innervates all extraocular muscles, excluding superior oblique and lateral rectus. Therefore, the eye will face down and out due to the unopposed contractions of these muscles. The trochlear nerve only supplies the superior oblique muscle. Consequently, the eye will be slightly extorted due to the loss of action of superior oblique. The consequence of this is that the patient may present with a slight head tilt. The patient may also describe having double vision at times. Finally, a sixth nerve palsy will present with unopposed adduction of the eye due to the paralysis of lateral rectus. So that's me. We'd love to hear your feedback on what you thought of this video and what topics you'd like us to cover in the future. You can do this by leaving a comment or dropping us an email.